that if that order suits you. Yeah, that's fine. Um, well, I I didn't really like. I grew up in a small town um, in the mountains, and I didn't have Wi-Fi or really even running electricity up there. So I never had an iPod or a phone or access to the internet before I had moved to the city. And so once, and the school there was really small too. It was all, there was only one school in the entire town, pre-K through eighth grade. That was the school I grew up at. And then when I moved to Bakersfield, there was 3,500 kids at one school and it was only two grades. So I went from having, you know, five kids in my class all day to having 30 kids in a class, uh, eight different classes in a day. So it was all super new to me. And, um, you know, I'd never had a crush or a boyfriend or a first kiss or anything like that before. Um, and so I was picked on quite a bit for the first couple weeks that I was attending school. And they would make fun of me for, you know, not being up to date with everything, being from the mountains. I didn't know the slang and I didn't know what was popular. Um, and so when a guy finally did take notice of me and was, you know, uh, interested in me, or, well, I thought he was interested in me, uh, we started my first relationship. And so after, um, after a while of being in a relationship with him, his friends would come up to us at school during like the lunch break and like ask us a bunch of questions and, and try to pressure me into doing different things like kissing him when I'd never had my first kiss before and just saying all sorts of things. And one night, this is during the last, um, last semester of my seventh grade year. Uh, they, the boy I was dating at the time, he asked me um, to send him a video of myself. And I didn't really understand what he meant at first. So he had sent me a video from Pornhub of a girl undressing herself and just basically showing herself off to the camera. And he asked me to do that. And I told him I wasn't really comfortable. So he continued to ask me every night after we got back from school, He, because I, I had gotten my first iPod at this point and I'd gotten a messenger app on it called Kick to talk to people at school. Um, so he would message me on that app every night after school, asking me to send the video. And I always tell him, no, I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable doing that. I didn't even know what to do. And he's like, oh, it's perfectly fine. You know, everybody does it. Everybody our age is doing that. And if, if we're really in a relationship, if you truly love me, then you'd send me something like that. And I, I still, for a while, I'd tell him, no, I wasn't uh, really comfortable doing that. And so um, after a couple of weeks of it, he was like, fine, then, you know what? This isn't even a real relationship. I don't know why I continue to bother you. If you're not even willing to send me something that I'm going to send you, then it'll be over, whatever. Unless you are going to send it, then I'll send you one too. And so um, I took a quick little video, like a minute long, and I sent it to him. And the, for the first couple of days afterwards, I didn't notice any difference. Um, but then his friend group started coming up to us during lunch and making little comments um, about like my body and about how I was a freak and um, about how he, they wish their girlfriends would do stuff like I do. And so at that point, I was getting upset because I, I had a feeling that he had shown it to them um, when he had told me that he would delete it right afterwards. And after that, um, I started noticing even more kids at school would look at me or make little comments to me. And then that's about a week and a half, two weeks after I first sent it, that was when I found out that it had been sent around to to most of the school. Um, and after that, uh, I had summer break happened. I had broken up with him because I did find out he sent it to his friends and his friends sent it to their friends who then sent it to their friends. Um, and so it went around the entire school and all the neighboring schools. 
And then during the summer break before eighth grade, um, we moved. So I thought, you know, okay, things would be better because at that point I didn't know that other people had seen it or that it had been posted online. But when I started at the new school, after about two weeks of being there, um, somebody sent me a link through Kick. Somebody who had made an anonymous account sent me a link through Kick, and it was the video that I had sent to my ex-boyfriend, and it had been posted on Pornhub with the caption, 13-year-old brunette shows off for the camera. Um, and so after that, I started ditching school a lot, started getting really depressed, um, started getting into drug use, and I tried to, I begged my mom to transfer me schools. I told her like that this school was um, way ahead of what we had been learning up in the mountains, so I wasn't up to date. And I asked her if I could just do homeschooling instead so I could get caught up, but she was super busy and she had uh, five other kids to take care of on her own as a single parent. So obviously she said no. Um, so I kind of just made it through the eighth grade year. And before, before all of this, I'd always been a straight A student. I'd always had honor roll or principal's list. I'd always gotten uh, the achievement after every quarter and at the end of the year for it. Um, but towards the end, the last quarter of seventh grade year and all of eighth grade year, I just barely passed my classes. My grades started really rapidly slipping, uh, mostly because I was no longer like regularly attending school. I would ditch school a lot. And even on the days when I did go to school, I would just hide in a bathroom stall for the most of the day um, or attempt to leave if I could. Um, so after that, I, I had messaged Pornhub to get the video taken down. I pretended to be my mother and cause I, I really didn't want to tell my mom because, you know, she's a single mother of six kids and she was raised Catholic. So she had very strict views on stuff like this. So I knew she would be angry and I knew it would cause problems for her. So I didn't want to tell her. So I tried to deal with it on my own by, um, telling the I I typed in the the report a uh, problem for on the video and I said or flagged it and I said hey this is um this is my daughter she's only 14 now uh this is child pornography pornography please take this down and they you know they it took like a week or two to respond and then once they finally responded they're like oh yes okay we'll take it down and then proceeded to wait another two weeks before they finally did take it down. And um, doing my research, I was told that um, that they had a system in place that when a, a video was labeled as child pornography on their site, that it was like flagged and tagged and that it could no longer be re-uploaded. Um, but of course that wasn't true because a week after it had been taken down, it had been re-uploaded again. And so all of the people my age and a couple grades above me um, and even a couple grades below me uh, had, had all mostly seen the video because even when I transferred schools after eighth grade, I transferred to a school all the way on the other side of town um, for high school. They had all seen the video as well. After that, I basically dropped out of public school. And um, ever since I've still been the videos, I, even whenever I find them, people will send them to me. All They'd send them to me all the time. Like, oh my God, is this you? Like people off the internet who I've never met in person, they'll find my accounts on social media and they would send them to me and be like, oh, this is you, isn't it? And then try to ask me certain questions or be really creepy towards me or try to dox me or harass my family members. Um, a lot of people in the grades above me, um, mostly guys, they would try to harass me and blackmail me saying that if I didn't do stuff with them or I didn't send more videos to them, that they would send it to my family. They would send it to my grandma, to my mom, to all my sisters, my brother. Um, so I really just, I took myself off of social media for a while, stopped going to school got really depressed. And I thought once I stopped 
being in the public so much, once I stopped going to school, people would stop stop re-uploading it. But that didn't happen because it had already been downloaded by people all across, you know, the world, basically. And it, it would always be uploaded over and over and over again. No matter how many times I got it taken down, it'd be right back up again. So that was the whole reason I ended up reaching out to Mike. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for, is there anything else that you'd like to um, finish with your opening uh, comments? Otherwise we'll turn to, to Mr. Bowie now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for telling us your story. Uh, Mr. Bowie, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll just introduce myself briefly to the committee. My name is Michael Bowie. Uh, I'm a partner in Manhattan uh, at the law firm of, of Brown Rudnick. Um, we have been investigating uh, Pornhub and MindGeek, its parent and its other sites for just about a year. Um, among uh, included in that investigation are hundreds of accounts uh, that are similar uh, to Serena's um, of underage women um, who were children who had exploited material posted on Pornhub of adult women who were raped and the rape was videotaped and put on Pornhub of trafficked women uh, who've had their videos put on Pornhub um, and all sorts of other non-consensual content that's been put on Pornhub. In the short time I have, I want to address uh, four topics, uh, which hopefully will, will serve as somewhat of a roadmap for questions and, 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 uh, and follow-up. First, I want to talk about what is it we really hear about? How did we get here? MindGeek's knowing decision to commercialize this type of conduct, and where do we go to he where do we go from here? What do we hear about? It's really a question of what we're not here about. And I'll explain why I need to raise this right up front in a second. This is about rape, not porn. It's about trafficking, not consensual adult performance or entertainment. This is not about policing consensual adult activity. It's not about religion. I think even in these days, everybody can agree that no industry should be commercializing and monetizing in rape, child abuse, and traffic content. And I think we all expect that any legitimate business or industry wouldn't do so and would do whatever it could to make sure that type of conduct content doesn't pollute its product. So why am I raising this? I'm raising this because for the last year, when public scrutiny started to be focused on MindGeek, a Canadian company, about the fact that it, in fact, knowingly commercialized and monetized this type of content, instead of acknowledging the problem and aggressively dealing with it, what it has aggressively done is conducted a gaslighting campaign in the media and social media to discredit victims and deflect from the issue and blame it on other things. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But this is a real problem. It's real in the sense that it happens, it's not isolated, and it's awful. And it's significant. It is not one or two people here or there. Certain things have slipped through the cracks. As I'll explain in a minute, this type of content, content is part of the business model. And not just for MindGeek, which is of particular importance to this committee because it's a Canadian company, but for its competitors and in the industry. But, but just to drive home how real it is, let me give you just a few examples of other victims who we've talked to and verified. A woman or a girl who is raped at 15, video posted on Pornhub and distributed through a community. Pornhub refused to remove the video for three weeks then said it had been removed when in fact it wasn't removed for another two months with several hundred thousand additional views, downloads, and distribution in that community. A child younger than 10 who was sold into trafficking and was a subject of child pornography for almost 10 years. Those videos were distributed on various MindGeek platforms where they can remain at least 
um, until later last year. A 15-year-old who was secretly filmed via computer hack and then extorted to do other videos, and those videos were posted on Pornhub with her personal information, distributed widely, including to her community and to her family, and subjected her to long-term abuse and stalking. When she raised the issue at Pornhub, it refused to search for the videos or take any other proactive steps to prevent their distribution. The trauma led her to consider suicide. A woman who was raped on videotape and was distributed on Pornhub, including through her community. A 17-year-old who was secretly recorded by an underage boyfriend that was posted to Pornhub that was distributed throughout her school, community, and to her family, subjecting her to harassment and extortion. A woman who was drugged and raped after meeting someone on a date. The rape was videotaped and posted on Pornhub. We believe it was sold on Pornhub by the person who posted it. A 14-year-old who was secretly recorded by a boyfriend who posted the video to Pornhub and distributed it again through his school and community. Child pornography posted on Pornhub of an individual that had hundreds of thousands of views and an unknown number of downloads. When confronted, Pornhub failed to report it to the authorities, which is something I'll talk about in a second. 16-year-old who was co coerced into a sexual act, which was videotaped and posted on Pornhub without her knowledge or consent. A 16-year-old girl who was trafficked by two American men who filmed the sexual acts as part of the trafficking. In fact, that was what she was offered for. And those were posted to Pornhub. And this individual is aware of other women in that trafficking ring who were sold for the same purpose. Underage girl trafficked for years by a business colleague of her father's. Videos were monetized on Pornhub. She reported the incident, but the videos were not taken down for an extended period of time. An underage girl attempted suicide multiple times and turned to drugs after videos were posted on Pornhub. Those are just a few examples. There are many, many examples uh, that we've found. We've, we've investigated hundreds. We've talked to several dozen victims um, who we've been able to verify. Um, and we've talked to advocates, investigators, media people, industry people, and whistleblowers. These are not isolated incidents. It's a real problem. How did we get here? Well, we got here um, like we've gotten in many places at this stage uh, in our culture, because the internet was a major disruptor in the pornography industry. Prior to tube sites, um, the, por the, the pornography industry did a, had a policing mechanism. There were statutes. We have 2257 in the States. It requires anyone who's going to produce pornographic material to have written consents that say they, they verified the age and that stuff is consensual. If you were going to distribute it, if you were going to sell it, if you were going to stream it on the Acme Hotel Company Entertainment Center, um, if you were going to put it on a cable channel, uh, everything you 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 were going to you were going to distribute had to have that disclosure on it that in fact those rules had been complied with, and um, and that system worked relatively well. wasn't perfect, but it worked. Enter the tube site, where anyone could post anything at any time, and millions and millions of videos are posted in a given year. 2257, in our view, applies to much of MindGeek's, MindGeek's business model. It might not apply to all. It's pretty clear MindGeek and the industry's view is it doesn't apply at all. Um, and as a result, um, there was no requirement of the posters. There was no compliance on behalf of the tube sites. And then you add in how the business model for tube sites work and search engine optimization. The goal, of course, is to end up number one in Google searches. So if someone types in porn with a particular topic into Google, it will pull up your site first. 
And all of these sites, MindGeek and its competitors, were in basically an arms race to be number one. And I don't have anywhere near enough time, nor probably enough understanding to fully explain all the elements of search engine optimization. But what, what I can tell you is certain simple truths. Content is king, search terms are king, long search terms are king, descriptions are king. So the more content you have, the more titles you have, the more search, uh, the more tags you have, all of that is gold and optimization. And so decision industry is Canadian, but not by the Canadian alone, but including by this Canadian company, which essentially became the Monsanto of porn, um, that it would just simply not put any limits on content that was coming onto the site. Because when we've talked to whistleblowers and industry insiders, as soon as you start to try to somehow police and filter the content on your site, you start losing content. You start delaying upload times. You start losing the search engine optimization race. And so the fact of the matter is they didn't, they knew and decided not to do anything about this. And how do we know that they knew? Um, it's all the evidence is overwhelming. First of all, before tube sites, it was common knowledge in the industry that absent policing that non-consensual cont content, children, women being trafficked, rape videos, which are the essential, the, 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 the metaphor to a snuff film, those would find their way into commerce. That's why we had statutes on this. That's why there were studies. That's why there were congressional hearings. It was common knowledge. You couldn't be in this industry and know that if you took those away and just simply distributed anything, um, that you wouldn't end up with this content. Then you have the, the, the fact that they are, at the core of their business is search engine optimization. In fact, if you go to MindGeek's website, you would not know that it is the largest internet pornography company in the world. You would think it is a tech company. That is how it describes itself. It describes itself as an expert in search engine optimization, meaning knowing what's on its site, um, selling advertising to people who want access to those users, selling it smartly, selling it profitably, selling the data back to those people from that product. Um, and, and put simply, in terms of knowledge, um, a search engine optimization company like MindGeek running this business model on its sites knows as much about what's on that site as NASA knows about what's going on in the space capsule. That is to say, everything that's going on. And it does that on a daily basis. It optimizes that on, an, on a, on a real-time basis. And at the center of all this is an algorithm. And the algorithm, if you go to the site and you're drawn to that site with a particular search, it'll bring you. And then the algorithm figures out what else to send you to. Well, you need to know exactly what it is that's on your site to know what it is you're sending people to. And for people who would search for child pornography, for titles that we know are child pornography, um, it would, you would pull up a search and MindGeek itself, its algorithm, would begin directing the user to more and more and more of that content. It knew what was on its site, like NASA knows what's in a space capsule. Moderators who purportedly reviewed all the uploads, According to MindGeek's public statements and pronouncements, it reviews all the content that is uploaded to its site, which is to say it's an admission that all the child pornography that's found on that site, it reviewed. But, you know, it doesn't call internally the people externally it calls moderators. It doesn't call them that internally. It calls them formatters, and that's important because it shows you where the emphasis is. It's not really a moderator screening for content. It's a format or making sure that format is in the right format to maximize search engine optimization. How so? Is the title right? Are the tags right? Is the video the right length? But however you call it, they reviewed it. It's on their site. They knew it was there. 
and they chose to let it be there. Their treatments of complaints, comments, and red flags. You've heard Serena's story if you've read accounts in the in, in the press, and certainly from uh, people we've seen who are both victims, um, good Samaritans, appalled users. There is essentially a stone wall um, over the years when someone would raise a complaint. Um, it was to say it was non-responsive does not accurately characterize it. It was hostile. It was discouraging. It was designed to make people go away. Comments. Again, a search engine optimization company that understands and is using all of this content to maximize its, um, the value of its content and monetization. The comments sections on many of these videos where people explicitly are saying, this is obviously rape, where you have a woman who is clearly passed out drunk, where the person videotaping is opening her eye and poking her in the eye and being raped, where you have people who are saying, this person is clearly can't even be 12 years old. Those are all content that MindGeek is scanning and, and, and aware of on its site, yet those videos remained for years and they weren't the only videos. The treatment of illegal content, when they were called out um, um, and where they were forced to do something, you would think that, that, that the entire post would be deleted, uh, the user's account would be deleted, they'd look at the user's other accounts for similar content, uh, they would ban that content. Um, but in fact, the only thing that happened was the, the video would be disabled. So the link is still there. The page is still there. The search terms are still there. The tags are still there. They're there because now they can still use them in attempting to maximize their, their search engine optimization. And in fact, uh, last week, uh, I typed in a title. Uh, for a notorious um, example of a child rape uh, that occurred, that was taken down last year, around a little bit little, around this time. And even though MindGeek had taken down 10 million of its videos, and that that video had been taken down in the spring under public scrutiny, um, lo and behold, Google took me right back to Pornhub, that exact search, which just shows you how it works and why it was left up there. So all of that was left up there. So the user might not get the video because it was disabled, but the algorithm would then steer them to other content like that, other content that people had clicked on that and also watched something else. Um, oftentimes, the, uh, when, it was, when, when there were people who had some public scrutiny on things, or if NCMEC, uh, the US authority uh, on this, um, would direct them to take it down. They would post. Um, they would post something that would say taken down at the direction of Nick Mick, which I think they're required to do. When they were forced to take it down, oftentimes instead they would say taken down due to a copyright violation, even though they knew that wasn't what it was. We also have examples of when when public scrutiny has been been drawn to uh, non consensual content based on comments and tags. We have examples of them going in and not removing the video but removing the content and tags. Um, the other evidence of their knowledge and intent to a trial lawyer like myself is what did they do over the course of the last year when all of this really finally got the public scrutiny it required? Um, as someone who advises companies who sometimes uh, end up in a jam because someone or something or their company did something that, that they shouldn't have done, uh, we all know what the right formula is. Uh, you acknowledge the problem. Uh, you indicate that you are going to fix the problem. Uh, you hire whoever it is from the outside um, and give them whatever resources you need to do that. Um, and then you go ahead and do that. That's what real companies do. That's what that's what that's what responsible companies do. Certainly, companies that are running businesses and industries that are as lucrative as this. But that's not what happened. The reason I started out my presentation uh, by with something that you might have thought was obvious, 
by saying, what are we here about and what are we not here about? Is because for a year, in response to this, despite the fact that nobody knew what was on Pornhub's site better than Pornhub and MindGeek, uh, MindGeek has run a gaslighting campaign that has denied this was a problem, denied its extent, discredited victims, discredited advocates, and essentially, and essentially attempted to silence everyone and deflect. They say, to this day, not just MindGeek, its agents, its allies, its industry networks are running a vicious social media astroturf campaign attempting to disparage anyone who pops up to speak about what is really happening. All the while saying not only that this stuff isn't true, but that the people who are saying it are intentionally misleading. They're lying, but they're not lying. They have, they have dot, they have, they have, they have accused people um, of, of raising these issues for ulterior motives because they have a problem with porn or consensual conduct or they, or they have some sort of religious zealot. But the fact is, it's not about any of that. That's just a way to distract people from what the real problem is. And of course, when the New York Times um, exposed the problem after looking at it and found what everyone else finds when they look at it. And then Visa and MasterCard, who had been told about this problem, but they also ignored it until the New York Times wrote its piece. It was only then that MindGeek, while still claiming that it takes all of this very seriously and always has, took down 10 million videos because it obviously has no idea whether those videos are consensual or not. And the AstroTurf campaign that has been run on social media has ended up doxing people. Uh, people have been hacked. We had a victim in Montreal who we were representing who felt threatened, who felt for her safety, who had tires slashed, and who then disappeared. I don't know where she is. We have investigators trying to find her. We're talking to law enforcement. I got a text message from somebody who claimed to be a roommate who said she'd had a car accident, was in a coma. That wasn't true. I don't know what happened to her. I have other examples like that. That's what's going on behind the scene. And part of what we have been investigating for this, this year is who has it been? And I'm not going to reveal that now, um, but we will soon. Um, and it's a very, very dangerous, reckless campaign that's being conducted to attempt to defend the indefensible. So what are the solutions? Real quick. One, um, we have to do our job and defend the victims um, who have been victimized, who continue to be victimized by people spreading lies about them, and in certain instances who've been subjected uh, to much worse conduct, um, and we're going to do that. Uh, but what prevents it from continuing? MindGeek has taken down 10 million videos, um, but it has competitors um, that have not gotten any scrutiny. It is the flagship. It is the metaphor for the whole industry. It is a big problem, um, but the problem is much bigger. It seems to me two things. One, uh, everyone agreed many years ago before the internet disrupted so much of our lives in good ways and bad, that with respect to pornography, it was reasonable to have certain requirements for people who were going to produce or distribute or transfer content that required them to ensure that it was consensual. Back then, that system worked pretty well because the industry was compared to what it is on the internet, somewhat finite smaller, and it worked. There were disclosures. People had to make sure, people had to keep paperwork. Um, and uh, if you were going to distribute it, you had to make sure they had that paperwork. That made sense then, and that makes sense now. Uh, there is no way that we are going to uh, stop this or have, have any effective um, mechanisms to limit it unless we have some of those mechanisms. 
And I don't think it's very hard, and I don't think it's unfair to require an industry that's making billions of dollars a year to have some basic compliance and moderate, moderating requirements. The other things I think we definitely need to do, um, uh, both Canada, the US, most countries have our equivalent of NICMIC um, uh, that uh, child pornography is sent to, uh, that then can make directions to uh, take down videos and notify law enforcement. Uh, there's a few things that are obvious to me. Um, the, the scope of this problem in the internet age requires that those functions be dramatically uh, developed and built up and become much more robust. Two, I think there needs to be more transparency. We need to make reports that that and academics and politics um, can look at uh, with a significant more transparency because um, obviously uh, that will make a big difference. And it prevents companies from saying, um, or will help prevent companies from denying problems simply because they know what's going on um, and we don't. And, uh, and most of all, as an industry, this industry has to begin acting like a real industry, like a real, uh, a real business industry that actually cares about what it is it's peddling, uh, as opposed to some uh, chemical company from the 70s uh, that didn't care, but was making money and was poisoning people. There's a reason MindGeek is called the Monsanto of pornography. Um, and what needs to be done by everybody is make that an impossible sort of position to maintain in this industry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowie. Uh, we will now turn to my colleagues here for some questions. We'll begin with uh, Ms. Stubbs to, to lead off. And uh, colleagues, again, I want to um, ensure that we have flexibility but time that uh, everybody can get some questions in as well. And so um, take the time that you need, but you, uh, but if you don't uh, take the full time, then we'll move on to the next uh, question. Ms. Stubbs, we'll turn to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Serena, thanks. Uh, for being here and for talking to us about your experiences. I want to tell you it's rare in life to be in the presence of someone who has um, rare and incomparable uh, strength and resilience like you have clearly demonstrated here. And I hope that through this process, you, you know, you're able to empower yourself and, and you, uh, you own your power that you have and that no one gives to you that's inherent in you and it's clear it's powerful within you and also I hope I hope you know right now or one day you will just the scope and the scale of what you're doing um, not just speaking on behalf of yourself but for for uh, quite clearly from both your testimony and your lawyer's testimony what is actually the experience of millions of people around the world. So thank you both. Um, I just, I wonder, Serena, if you, if there's anything else that you would like us to know about what your experiences were, you know, and, and what the impact was on you in your encounters with the representatives to try to get the images of you taken down and, um, and if there's anything more you want us to know about what that impact is like still an ongoing in, in your life from that experience. Yeah, um, so as Mike was talking, he was telling you about some of the other victims and um, I, I'm i one of the people who ended up homeless, ended up dropping out of school, ended up on drugs, um, completely detached, like, detached from my family. Uh, I ended up trying to kill myself many times. Uh, I ended up in mental hospitals. There was instances where the video would have like li literally 2.7 million views and it would still be on Pornhub despite hundreds of comments saying that, oh, this is definitely child pornography. That girl can't be any more than 14, 13. And yet Pornhub still wouldn't take it down. Even when I messaged them multiple times, it would take forever. And then when I did get a response, they would they would hassle me for all these other details. 
and I would have to go through the whole process of sending them pictures of me with my face next to my ID over and over and over again to prove that, yes, that video in there is child pornography. And even then, even after I proved all of that stuff, it would still take a while for them to take it down, which would gain hundreds of thousands more views. And like Mike said, they, they optimized that. They really had, like, the the titles would always be something like preteen, young teen, um, 14, 13. They would always list an age or an age category uh, in the actual title as well as the tags. And that was actually something you could search up on Pornhub before they made this whole big um, wash of the wash of the videos deleting that huge amount of them and it it still affects me like I have anxiety to this day um I I had always been a very bubbly like open friendly person and I'm I'm still friendly I'm still a nice person but I'm not so bubbly anymore I don't go up and introduce myself to people I don't really have many friends um I distanced myself from everyone. I kind of spent and still spend more times with my my dogs than I do with actual humans because just being around other people now causes me anxiety due to what happened when I was experiencing the, the most backlash from when the video ended up on Pornhub. When people, guys from school would literally follow me home from school harassing me the whole way to get me to do sexual acts with them or to get me to make videos with them or send them more content. And they tell me, well, it's already on there. Why, why did you share it with him if you can't share it with us? Obviously, you don't care. You must have posted it to the site yourself, saying all of these things. And then in addition to that, trying to blackmail me, saying that they would send it to my mother, send it to the rest of my family. And so it caused this huge buildup of anxiety and depression in me, which caused me to turn to drugs, to try to forget about it, um, to turn to suicide, to try to end it. And even still to this day, it's hard like talking about it and dealing with it. Cause even after the New York Times came out, um, once, uh, once Pornhub did that whole deleting of a bunch of videos, I still got a lot of um, comments, they wouldn't be sent directly to me because I, I privated and changed the names on most of my, uh, social media accounts, but they would comment them on other articles or on people discussing it on like Twitter, dropping my name in there saying I was responsible for ruining their lives because they can no longer watch their favorite videos. And that, um, and then there would be people who actually did find my social medias who, even after I changed my name, changed my my uh, profile pictures, changed everything about my profile so it would be more hard to find and put them on private, they'd still send me a message um, and try to send me a friend request like, oh, I saw your videos, your body is really nice. And I was 13, 14 in those videos. So um, it's still it still affects me even to this day, even You're after... Doing- everything they you know said they were doing to fix it yes well you're a leader in what you're doing right now and what we're here to do is figure out what we can do uh to help you fix it what what would um if you had the opportunity what would you like us to know about what you would say to to MindGeek to the people who run it i would tell them that they really like they're really selfish. They need to really look at themselves like in the mirror because they're prioritizing money and content over actual human beings' lives because obviously they don't care that much. They didn't make any major moves until the banks um, decided they wouldn't be supporting them anymore. And they'd always claim they, they, they would gaslight and they would, um, claim denial that any of the claims against them say they would say they were all untrue when my videos were uploaded over and over and over again and they always had the they'd always tell themselves they that oh they couldn't do anything unless they were reported but even when they were reported 
they still lagged on doing anything to fix the problem. So I would tell them to look in the mirror and reevaluate themselves. They need to figure out where real priorities are and not so focused on money and content rather than real humans' lives and what they're doing to them. Thank, thank you. Ms. Shanahan, we'll turn to you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I too, uh, Ms. Leitis, I am uh, so grateful for your courage uh, in coming forward uh, here today uh, before us uh, and sharing your, your uh, experience. Uh, and um, I, I am thinking of um, other young women who um, have may be in the same situation that you found yourself in and um and certainly bringing this out in the open is helping that conversation to 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 happen i'm thinking of of parents of of teachers of um adults who um you know when you described what happened in your school uh i feel that there's a huge uh, you were you were um let down in so many ways uh, that you had to deal with this your, yourself as a minor uh, what would you like other young women to know, or what 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 would you say to them uh, about the experience that you've gone through? I'd always I always like to like if, to take me for example. I took so long to tell anybody. Um, I always tried to deal with it myself, and it caused me years and years, and still to this day, I have anxiety depression to deal with. Um, I still have trouble communicating with people and actually going out in the world, like leaving my room and being out in, you know, real life because of what happened and because I tried to deal with it all by myself. So I would tell them to, you know, talk to somebody they trust. If, if they feel like they can't tell their mother or their father, maybe an aunt or uncle or a, another, um, like a, a principal or a counselor at school, just anybody, because I waited until the two days before the article came out to even tell my family what was going on. And for all these years, they never knew what was happening. And um, they were a little upset, of, of course, at first. But once they, you know, realized that all their previous assumptions as to why I was ditching school why I was having mental health episodes, um, why I had tried to kill myself, why I had turned to drugs. They realized that all of that was based on just, you know, because they had no idea what was really going on. And so I would tell them to really let somebody know. It's not, it's not going to help just dealing with it on their own. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Flaitis. I, I, do believe that your words here today are going to help many other people that are in a similar situation. So thank you so much for your continued, your continued courage uh, in, in coming forward. Uh, you described uh, the actions that you took to flag um, uh, the uh, material to uh, Pornhub, to to MindGeek, and uh, and I. I I can only share the the frustration of of kind of sending out this this message and not knowing how it's going to return. I wonder if if you or Mr. Bossy can can share with us uh, are those proceeds uh, the processes that were there were were they adequate in so far as as the you know the current regulations uh, are are they um you know are they the appropriate processes to have in place uh are the processes now uh improved um to take down content that is illegal and causes harm i guess i'm looking for a difference between the the processes and then the enforcement of those processes um i'm not very knowledgeable on uh all the different kinds of processes but what i can say is that they, they, their Pornhub always said that they could never do it. They, they had no idea what was on their site. Anybody could post and anybody could download what was on there. So they, they didn't know unless people would flag it and report it and that they would take whatever was flagged and reported seriously, um, review it and then take it down. 
But even with that, before all of this happened, before the New York Times article came out and the, the banks pulled out of supporting them, you know, if even when people would comment it directly onto the video, when they would flag it, report it, and even when I would message them over and over and over again, telling them the actual age I was in the video and um, telling them that it is clearly child pornography and that it is me in the videos and that I would like to take, I would like them taken down. They would still take, you know, a while to respond to me. And then when they did respond to me, they would always try to like, feign ignorance like oh sorry we didn't see this or until now and well they wouldn't apologize they'd be like oh we didn't see this until now and then they would basically basically tell me that I wasn't really telling the truth they'd ask me to verify my identity over and over and over again to make sure I really was the girl that was in the video and that um and it was it was very frustrating talking to them because I would sit there and I would type out a heartfelt response, you know, how I was truly feeling about that video being online and what it was doing to me. And they would respond with, okay, well, prove it's you. Like, sorry, can't do much other than that. And they, even when it was very clear, like, I, I still look y young now. I mean, I have a little makeup on right now, but, um, I'm told all the time I look a lot younger than I actually am because I, I hit puberty really late due to a hormone disorder I have um, where I age very slowly. So when I was 13 and 14, I still looked like I was nine or 10 years old. And it, it was very obvious that it was child pornography. So even without me having to verify my identity over and over and over again, just to get one video taken down, they could still blatantly see that there was a child in the video. And then on top of that, they, they told me that once a video was flagged, um, uh, uh, flagged as child pornography, it would be sent over to the authorities, to the uh, people in America who deal with um, child pornography, uh, who catalog it, um, and that it would be the actual video, like itself would be, um, tagged so that it couldn't be re-uploaded again onto their site, which very obviously wasn't true because the video would be uploaded over and over and over again. And and it wasn't that hard to find. Like it usually had around the same name or same title and same tags. It would always have the preteen or young teen, uh teen brunette, petite um 13 year old or small 14 year old girl. Like it was very blatantly obvious that it was marketed towards people who were looking for child pornography. And I believe that they really didn't care to make a change at all. And that even under public scrutiny that they were, they were really dragging their feet to, to get on with it, to do what they said they were going to do um, until money became involved until the two big banks pulled out, said that they wouldn't allow it to be used on their platform anymore. Um, and then all of a sudden, oh, suddenly Pornhub can do anything they want about the videos. They can delete 10 million videos in like a day when before it took them weeks and sometimes even months letting the videos get up to 3 million views of a 14-year-old girl before deleting it. So I believe they really, um, I don't know, the, all the laws and everything, but I believe Pornhub's, like, their reaction to it was very delayed and was very money-based, not actually about protecting children or, you know, people in general. Thank you. Madame Goudreau, we'll turn to you. Oui, bonjour à vous. Yes. What a good day to you. What an honor it is for us today. First of all, Serena, Flita, I, I don't know how to uh, say her name. Translation, I do apologize. I just want to make sure that they do have their translation turned on. At the bottom of your screen, you may see an icon just, that has interpretation. And if yeah, I just got it turned the, on now. Perfect. Okay. Well, 
we'll, we'll, we'll turn back to our, my colleague. She'll have to repeat herself. <laughs> Je vais parler tranquillement. I'm going to speak slowly so that you can uh, understand the interpretation. Is the speed all right? Good. So I would like to really congratulate you. We heard the word courage earlier, but um, I want you to know that I'm a mother of two young adults like you. And honestly, you really are a model. And I hope that you are also aware that every gesture of yours, every act of yours. So we heard about the bank, well, there were changes uh, because of that. But in any case, the future is coming. And it's people like you who will allow us to have laws changed because clearly you weren't respected in your personal life, in your private life, and uh, even less your, was your consent not respected. So we often hear business is business, but now we're talking about human beings and everything that you've said today not only, I hope that it was good for you to do it, I hope that it also brought you even more confidence. I see you here, and I see the future is before you. It's uh, very clear. You're very well supported as well. And when I hear Mr. Bowie speak with all the possibilities that he presented to us today, it will allow us to go further. And I don't have a question, or maybe I've, if you feel like answering to a comment, do you want us to continue to be in contact with you so that we can explain to you the process of what we're trying to do at the legal level for you and for all the others in your situation? So I say so you've shared way more um, pieces of uh, knowledge than we could have hoped for, and I really thank you for it. I appreciate that, and I really would, I would like to be, uh, continue to be updated on um, how the laws are changing and what that'll basically, you know, um, re demand like Pornhub to do. MindGeek to like um, what that basically entails them to follow because I, I'm not very um I'm not very updated I don't have a lot of knowledge on on laws. Thank you. We'll t we'll turn to Mr. Angus now. Well, thank you, Ms. Flightis and Mr. Bowie. Um, I was very. Lisa. Hello. Um, let's see. I think I had to turn off the um, language thing. Can you? Yep. Yes. Okay. Can we can start over? Now I can hear you. Perfect. Yes. We can start thank over. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Flighties Hi. and Mr. Bowie, I want to thank you so much um, uh, for your extraordinary testimony and what you've done uh, by coming forward as a witness. You are the one that put Pornhub on the run. It wasn't the big MasterCard and Visa. It was your willingness to be a voice and to step forward and, and to follow up on my colleague, Madame Goudreau. We thank you for your courage. Um, what we are here, it might seem like a bunch of people on a screen asking strange questions. This is how we make laws in our country. We get witness testimony. Uh, you tell us that you're not an expert um, in laws. Well, you are helping to shape the laws of the future to protect other survivors. So your testimony is so important to us today because we are going to take action. We are going to hold these guys to account. That is our job as legislators and as parents because the system failed you. So uh, you've given us so much and I'm not going to make you repeat all the good, the amazing things you've said, but I was really struck by your, you said how they hassled you when you as a child was trying to get control of your life again from the exploitation, from the criminal acts that were done to you. 
that they, as a massive corporation, hassled you. Could you explain to me uh, what what that means and what you think we should make them do so that they don't hassle any other young women anywhere in the world? Yeah. Um, so basically, when like the videos were first uploaded online, and I didn't want to tell my mom about them, um, then I pretended to be my mom. They would say like, "Oh, well, it's not actually you in the video." So to provide proof that that's your daughter and that she's underage, you're gonna have to provide like, um, basically like pictures of me next to some sort of identification. And like, they would ask for all these different things and they would ask for, um, even after I would send one picture next to whatever identification they would ask for, they would ask for another picture next to a different identification and so on and so forth. Just dragging out the process so long, even though it was very obvious, it was a child in the video. Even if say I wasn't, say if even I wasn't the girl that was in the video, they could still tell that was a child in the video and they were still dragging out this process because they didn't want to take the video down because it had at that point millions of views and it was bringing them in ad revenue and, um, you know, clicks to their site. It would be a, a top at the, uh, at the top of Google for the searches. And it's just, it, it amazes me how they continue to do that even after, you know, um, uh, even after hearing that so many other people went through this and knowing that I wasn't the only one that they would do this to, it's just like how it, I don't understand how, how they can be okay with it and how in their mind they can sit here and think like, okay, well, this isn't the girl in the video or I'm going to make her prove over and over and over and over again that it is her in the video, even though we can see it's child pornography. We're just going to make sure it's her that wants it taken down before we take it down, even though they should have just taken it down because it was child pornography. Well, thank you. I'm going to ask Mr. Bowie about this. Um, if MindGeek is promoting a video that says 13-year-old girl or 14-year-old girl, in Canada, we have very strong child pornography legislation, and it's anyone under 18. So the, this, the fact uh, that the corporate response to this young woman, this child, was that they didn't believe she was the one in the video, or they didn't believe that she was the, the mother, she was pretending to be her own mother, um, and that they would have to go through that level of proving when what they were promoting was criminal in in behavior um do you believe that there i'm under an american law or we we are looking under canadian law whether or not they there are criminally liable for the fact that they were aware and they were promoting uh child pornography online to their viewers for monetization um <clears throat> yes look i i think I, I think this is something the law can be improved on because the internet the law was written before the internet and tube sites but I have no question under under American law that there are criminal violations here, um, and including so. For example, I raised two two five seven for a reason, because it's so basic. Before the internet, the American law required that if you were going to produce pornographic material, explicit material, you had to have just paperwork that showed the person was of age and it was consensual, and you had to keep the paperwork. And then if you were going to send it and give it to somebody to sell or broadcast or whatever, you had to have a disclaimer on it that showed, okay, I, this is what I did. And here's where you can find the paperwork. Right. Um, the point being that it was the responsibility of the people producing it to make sure it was consensual. And if you were going to distribute it, transfer it, show it, you had to make sure that that person made sure that is sense. It wasn't controversial when it was in, when it when it was enacted way back in the '90s. We should, I think, we should all agree on it now. But the default in this industry is, um, it's it it's consensual and adult until you prove to me otherwise, which can't that shouldn't be the standard. Um, it can't possibly be an effective standard. Um, and I don't think, and I don't think it actually is the standard. So one example, and I think lawyers could argue over 
what aspects of MindGeek's um, business 2257 applies to which one doesn't, but it clearly applies to transferring pornographic material. When, when a person uploads to Pornhub, to Pornhub um, perhaps lawyers could argue that, the, uh, that Pornhub is just receiving the information and under the various definitions, which sort of were before tube sites, lawyers could argue whether, whether 2257 applies to them at that point. I think it does, but, but, but there's an argument, and that's why legislators could probably should probably update that law. But they almost immediately then take that content from Pornhub and push it out to their other sites, which clearly falls under 2257 in my view. And they don't have the required documents, and there's no disclaimer on that material. And so the only response, so, so this entire industry, the, the, what one of the members asked, what about the process? I, I, I've done, I've been, I've been a lawyer for 30 years. I've did plaintiffs and defense in a lot. I have never seen a situation where there was so much disregard and indifference to what was obviously child pornography, rape, trafficking content, illegal content on this site. I, I, so there was no process. And that's why this issue of gaslighting is so important to me. This entire year, if you were simply listening to their public pronouncements of, of MindGeek, of its agents that are in its sort of network of performers and otherwise of its allies in the industry, you would think they have all this process and they have all this technology um, and that this stuff just, you know, mistakes were made. Hmm. And I'm telling you that, that when we're done and the proof comes out, and if you're able to sort of go and, 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 and do the type of investigation we've done, you will just find out that is a bunch of B ass. There was no process. Moderators. The moderators, oh, I'm sorry. No. Sorry, just because I'm going to, this is really, really important. I think we're going to have to draw you back as a witness on this, but I'll defer to the chair on that. But section 162-1 of the criminal code in Canada, it is illegal to record or film a person who had a reasonable expectation of privacy it is an offense to distribute such content or possess such content. It is an offense to distribute if the person did not consent. And then that leads us into the one set, section 163 about the distribution of child pornography. So these are the laws. We also have a law uh, from 2011 on the obligations of ISP, ISPs to report uh, flagged examples of child pornography. And yet we have Ms. Flight is raising known issues of child pornography and being told, prove it to us before we do anything. So I just want to ask you when my time left, I'm going to read one other statement. It's from Pornhub's terms of reference. Pornhub claims they, quote, take a strong stand against any form of child exploitation or human trafficking. If we discover that any content involves underage individuals or any form of force, fraud or coercion, we will remove the content and submit the report to the proper law enforcement authorities. If you become aware of such content, you agree to report it to the website by contacting legal at pornhub.com. So I would end with a simple question to Ms. Flightis and Mr. Bowie. Uh, is that promise made by Pornhub? Uh, is, is that worth the paper it's printed on? Ms. Flightis. No. Um I doubt, like, um, like the study shows, I Pornhub only reported so many accounts of child pornography being on their site, and they always try to shift the responsibility from themselves onto the people who are uploading the content when it's their site. They should require people to verify their age and verify who they are, and that they're actually the people in the video before it can get uploaded instead of just letting whatever be uploaded and then downloaded off their site. Um, and then, ooh, oops, okay, now that it's flagged as child pornography, now we're going to make people prove it's child pornography before we actually do something. 
because at the end of the day, they really don't want to remove the video. So they want, but when in, when in reality, their whole, their whole process should have been from the beginning, having people verify their, their age and identity before the video can even get uploaded. So I don't think their promise is worth the paper at all. And Mr. Bowie, um, should we take them at their word that if, if these issues are identified, uh, they will take action? Those, those statements are just categorically lies. They just are. If you discover, if we discover, well, what do they mean by discover? Does someone have to come in and get a judgment and, and, and prove something? You can't believe your eyes. Uh, victims can't come in and tell them these things. Um, if we discover. Um, no, I, I think, I, look, I, I think they have said, I, I, I've emphasized this because it tells you the company you're dealing with. You are not, you are dealing with a rogue company. You're dealing with a rogue company who you don't know who owns it. I don't know who owns it. No one really knows who owns it. Um, its behavior here is completely out of bounds. It's, it's, it's just in a different universe of the way even bad, but mainstream corporate citizens work. It's not. And, and those statutes that you cited, I have no doubt, we have, we have analogs in the U.S., uh, lawyers can argue about exactly where they where they apply and what aspects, but they clearly apply. And so, for example, I think you know, MindGeek has servers in the United States. I believe it has servers in Canada. I believe those servers have been uh, the, with the, one of the largest, if not the largest, repository possession repository of child pornography in North America. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. I do apologize that uh, the time did get away on us, but I, Charlie, I did, uh, Mr. Angus, I did want you to finish those questions because we had many colleagues that uh, stated Thank that in so fact they wanted to uh, to answer those. Yeah. He wanted they wanted answers to those questions. I also know that there's some of you colleagues that do need to now leave, and so I appreciate the fact that we've gone over time. Uh, in a significant way, and I do uh, thank Ms. Philaitis and, uh, and Mr. Bowie for your testimony. Uh, thank you for uh, your patience with the technical the technology, and uh, we look forward to continuing um, uh, to uh, in this study. Um, we, we hope that we uh, we can rely on on both of you maybe in the future as well. I know the committee members have already indicated that they'd like to uh, to continue a dialogue with you on on a number of fronts, and so. Uh, colleagues, we will, um, Mr. Angus, I'll recognize you, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, Chair. I just wanted to ask Mr. Bowie, as we're beginning this study, and this is very new terrain for us, uh, we do have a number of powers as a parliamentary committee uh, for summoning witnesses, for obtaining documents, um, production of documents. If there's areas that you believe we should be looking at, would you be willing to share that uh, with our clerk so that we are better prepared to, to undertake a thorough investigation because this will be about uh, bringing to Parliament suggested changes in the laws uh, if we find that there's been an absolute failure and it looks very concerning to us right now. Absolutely. Thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, th thank you. Uh, we'll turn to Mr. Vierson. I see that he's indicating uh, that he has a question. Mr. Vierson. I, just uh, uh, to Mr. Bowie, um, we've invited uh, Ferris Atune and David Tassilo um, to our committee. Uh, we're hoping that they make an appearance. Those are some of the executives of MindGeek that we've been able to track down. Uh, is that your understanding as well? Those are the people we should be after, or is there other uh, other executives as well that we may have missed? Um, I think you need to speak to a gentleman named Corey Erlman, who's there. Um, and um, I think you need to talk to those individuals about who actually owns the company, in what form, um, and, and who do they take direction from. Because uh, I know those people have been publicly fronted as owners. Uh, I suppose there's different types of ways you could call someone an owner. Uh, but our information, uh, other public information, is that the people who are the beneficial owners, the people who control this company, who really hold the economics, um, are not known. Um, and I think in, 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 a, in, in this situation, they need to be known because I don't, think, uh, I don't think the gentlemen you spoke to are the ultimate word in how this company is run. Thank you. Again, thank you, Ms. Philaitis, 
Thank you, Mr. Bowie. We appreciate your testimony and look forward to, to talking again. Uh, we will now adjourn. Thank, Thank you, you for having us.